Hey everyone. So there's this, there's been this video going around uh, by Constantin Kissin, who is a secular guy that has a, a YouTube channel. He has a show called Trigonometry. And in this, he talks to people from various points of views, different perspectives, people on different sides of the aisle, whether it's politically, religiously, ideologically, all across the spectrum. And he talks to everybody. And I, I, think, that's, I think that's a really uh, admirable, wonderful thing to, to do, especially in this day and age. And um, he, comes, he comes with the viewpoint that after October 7th, he didn't really know much about what was going on in the region, hadn't really studied it ever, didn't really read much about it, didn't really know much about anything about the situation. And he had people from both the very pro-Palestinian uh, side and, and the pro-Israel side and interviewed them over the course of uh, the past year at this point and um, had been really formulating his opinions based on what he had read and what he had learned in his discussion and what he'd been listening to throughout the course of this year. And he came out with a video fairly recently that said that he's now off the fence when it comes to Israel and he agrees with the pro-Israel side. Now, uh, I wanted to just watch this video with you because I think it's an important, uh, I think it's important, uh, number one, because if you hadn't seen it yet, it's it's certainly worth the watch. Um, but he, he the, even the way that he introduces his viewpoints, I think is important for folks, especially in the Jewish community to know, because a lot of people that I've run into over the past year uh, from the Jewish community have, have thought to themselves that if their non-Jewish friend doesn't have as strong opinions uh, or viewpoints or understandings of the situations that they have, they're maybe insulted, or maybe they feel that they're not speaking the same language. Most people, as it turns out, don't really know all that much about what's going on over there, even or what has gone on over there. The history, uh, or not only the history of the of the of the situation at hand, but the the regional history um, as a whole. And so I think it's important to understand that this is kind of where most people are. Even many folks in the Jewish community uh, or in the Arab world don't really know all that much about what's going on or what has gone on and are just sort of like snapping into their, you know, their supposed sides that they're supposed to be on. I think it's important for us to give the benefit of the doubt and recognize that most people just have no clue what's going on and to provide educational uh, videos and matters uh, that, that can be helpful in that, rather than to critique or be insulted by someone who doesn't share the same enthusiasm uh, that you have for your whatever viewpoints it is that you have. On, on this particular situation. So I wanna, I wanna just watch this with you, maybe interject a few, a few points uh, based on what he's talking about, but really just kind of watch it together with you and then see what you think of the matter. So yeah, let's check it out. I'm off the fence about Israel's war. Here's why. Exactly a year ago, when thousands of Hamas militants crossed Israel's border to engage in an orgy of medieval violence, I knew little about Israel and had no opinion about the long-running conflict there. I've never been to Israel. I've never been to Gaza. I've never been to the West Bank. It's not a conflict I studied at university or read about extensively. People on both sides who care passionately about this issue find it hard to believe. But in truth, most people are like this. That's why, for many months after the October 7th attacks, I avoided commenting on the war or even discussing it on our show. Instead, I read, watched, and listened to the endless commentary, debates, and discussions to understand what people on various sides were saying. Having gathered those perspectives, I then did my best to apply first principles thinking to the arguments I heard. Thinking from first principles means stripping whatever you're trying to analyze down to its core and working back from there. Context is extremely important to understanding. But when it comes to highly emotive situations like this one, people often flood you with emotional context, which does not support the argument they're actually making. There are some obvious examples in this debate, which we will address shortly. First principles thinking helps you see the structure of arguments. The logic of an argument is like the skeleton of a body. You cannot see it from the outside, but it is usually the cause of why the body moves the way that it does. Getting to the skeleton of an argument is essential to understanding it. This was my approach when we had prominent pro-Palestine guests like Bassem Youssef and Norman Finkelstein on trigonometry, as well as pro-Israel guests like Ben Shapiro and Natasha Hausdorff. 
It was also my approach when I hosted a fiery debate on the subject of dissident dialogues, and when Safety Namus invited me to discuss this issue on this podcast. So what does first principle thinking tell us about the conflict? First, the easiest way to understand a complicated problem is to find a comparable situation about which you already know what to think. For example, if we accept that October 7th was a terrorist attack, as I believe most people do, the obvious approach would be to compare it to other terrorist attacks in recent history. That, as it happens, is impossible, because on a proportionate basis, the Western world has never experienced an attack on this scale. If we take 9-11, the most impactful terrorist attack in living memory, which shook the world's dominant superpower to its very core, we see that 2,977 people were killed in a country of 285 million people. On October 7th, approximately 1,200 people were killed in a country of just 9 million people. Some keep calling October 7th Israel's 9-11. That isn't remotely true. If October 7th was Israel 9-11, on a per capita basis, only 100 people would have been killed. In other words, October 7th was at least 12 times as bad as 9-11. And that's before accounting for the fact that Hamas took hundreds of hostages, many of whom have been killed since. So the obvious question is, if thousands of armed Mexicans had penetrated the southern border of the United States, killed 36,000 Americans and dragged off thousands of hostages, how would America have reacted? Would there still be a Mexico to speak of? Whatever your view of the history of this conflict, I believe the logic of this is impenetrable. However, there are some persuasive arguments from the anti-Israel camp which are aimed at contextualizing October 7th. Let's look at them. Number one, history did not start on October 7th. The crux of this argument, when broken down to its central premise, is that the state of Israel is illegitimate. In this conception, Israel was created because land belonging to Palestinians was taken by Western powers and given to European Jews fleeing the Holocaust. Palestinians were not consulted, did not give consent, and found themselves kicked out of their homes. Israel is a settler colonial state. Two. I just want to make a just a brief comment on that, that that, that is not true, and, and that, uh, first of all, the people that came uh, back to the land of Israel, the Jews are the indigenous people to that particular uh, area. And when the people were coming back, it wasn't uh, colonial European uh, the Europeans only returning to the land of Israel. There's also half of half of the people that came back to the land of Israel were of Sephardic descent, meaning they came from Arab countries. So it's not a colonial, uh, a, a colonialist uh, activity. It's decolonizing. Let's just just uh, FYI. October seventh was a response to Israeli brutality and oppression. Those of you who watched my debate with Safety in Amos will recall that he made this argument repeatedly. The people of Gaza and the West Bank are treated so badly, he argued, the response we saw on October 7th was totally understandable. An act of resistance aimed at redressing the wrongs they have suffered. 3. Israel is killing civilians. The scenes of parents pulling their children out of rubble speak for themselves. 4. Israel is engaged in indiscriminate attacks, which is why so many innocent people are dying. This argument aims to prove that Israel is the bad guy in this war because it is killing lots of people, either deliberately or due to a callous disregard for the lives of Palestinians. These are, to the best of my knowledge, the four principal arguments made by the anti-Israel side. If there are others, please let me know in the comments and I will address them in a follow-up video. Let's go through the arguments one by one. And for the sake of argument, let us accept that every point in each argument is valid and historically accurate. I know many viewers will find this objectionable, but I believe the best way to unpack this entire discussion is to take people's arguments as valid and see if they make sense. The first argument, whose central premise is that Israel is illegitimate, seems to be at the core of every debate. It feels reasonable and logical to many people to contextualize Israel's response to October 7th in this way. After all, if Israel was created through illegitimate means, it puts the discussion on an entirely different footing, doesn't it? Well, actually, no, it doesn't. Again, let's think from first principles. If we believe every pro-Palestinian claim and accept that Israel was created through the forced placement of European Jews in a foreign land by Western powers, we must look for a comparable situation in which a country was created through some form of displacement of the native population. Most of you live in such a country. The United States, Australia, New Zealand and Canada are all the products of invasion, colonization and brutal conquest. If you go back far enough, so is almost every other country in the world. Like it or not, Israel exists. It's home to over 9 million people. The idea that they would, could or should accept the destruction of what is now their country is absurd. 
the United States government would not tolerate missile strikes and terrorist rampages from Native American reservations. Neither would any government of any country under any circumstances. Peace in the Middle East will not be achieved by attempting to undo many decades of history. The second argument centers on the idea that October 7th was a response to Israeli occupation and brutality. This, again, seems reasonable to many people. After all, what would it take for you to behave the way Hamas did on October 7th? The problem with this argument is that what happened on October 7th was not an attempt to weaken Israel militarily. It was not an attempt to break Hamas militants out of Israeli jails. It was not an attack on the Israeli Defense Force. It was not a prison breakout, as some people like to describe it. Because when people break out of a prison, they don't normally head to the nearest town and start massacring women and children. October 7th was, by design and implementation, a terrorist attack whose purpose was to slaughter civilians, terrify Israeli society, and nothing else. This was not an act of resistance. It was an act of terrorism. Which is why Israel had to react to it in the manner that it has, and why any other country would have done the same. The third argument is that Israel is killing civilians. This is the one claim made by the anti-Israel side that is undeniably true. However, this is an example of the emotive but irrelevant context I mentioned earlier. Civilians are always killed in war. The question is not whether they are being killed, but who bears responsibility for their deaths and who can stop the killing. Again, applying first principles thinking, we must reach for a comparable example. There is no exact equivalent that comes to mind, but there is some useful context we can consider. Hamas has repeatedly stated that given the opportunity, they will repeat the October 7th attacks again and again and again. While this may seem shocking to us in the West, it makes perfect sense given that Hamas believes Israel is illegitimate and would like to see it gone. This means that unless Israel destroys or degrades their ability to carry out their threats, it is likely to experience more terrorist attacks again and again. Does anyone seriously believe that any government of any country anywhere in the world would or could react to something like 12 9-11s in one day and the threat of more to follow as many times as possible with anything other than all-out war? And who can end the killing? Well, theoretically Israel could of course, but for the reason we just discussed, they can't, won't and shouldn't. That leaves Hamas, who could have returned the hostages and surrendered the people who took them. And what is more, they could hide their civilians in the vast network of tunnels they've built to reduce casualties. Instead, they refuse to build bomb shelters and do everything they can to maximize civilian casualties. That's not my opinion, it's something Hamas are themselves proud of. A senior spokesman for the group, Sami Abu Zuhri, gave an interview on Palestinian station Al-Aqsa TV the last time this conflict flared up. The policy of people confronting Israeli warplanes with their bare chests in order to protect their homes has proven effective against the occupation, he said. We in Hamas call upon our people to adopt this policy in order to protect Palestinian homes. So yes, the deaths of civilians are tragic, and in a modern world where you can fill your social media feed with gruesome footage, that tragedy can be broadcast straight into your home 24-7. But the responsibility for their deaths is entirely with Hamas, and the failure to put a stop to the killing is theirs and theirs alone. Which brings us to the final argument. Israel's attacks are indiscriminate and designed to inflict civilian casualties. This is actually the simplest argument of the four to address because it is an empirical matter. The war in Gaza is not the first conflict in human history. We can compare the ratio of combatant to civilian deaths in this war to others. What happens when we do? Historically, urban warfare operations result in a casualty ratio of nine civilians for every one enemy fighter killed. In Gaza, it is two to one. In other words, Despite the deliberate attempts by Hamas to increase the number of civilian casualties, Israel has been extraordinarily successful in reducing them. This doesn't mean that there won't be incidents in which innocent Palestinians are killed and, as in any war, there will likely be war crimes committed by both sides. But overall, the numbers don't lie. If you need further evidence that claims of Israel's indiscriminate attacks are nonsense, just look at the way various commentators reacted to what has been dubbed Operation Grim Beeper. Thousands of Hezbollah pages were rigged with explosives and then detonated simultaneously, killing and injuring thousands of terrorists and a small number of bystanders. The pages in question were not picked at random. Israel specifically selected a batch of senior Hezbollah operatives. And still, people like Hamza Youssef, Scotland's former first minister, complain about Israel's indiscriminate attacks. This was definitionally the most precise targeted and surgical large-scale anti-terrorist operation in human history. In summary, 
I've engaged with an open mind and in good faith with all the anti-Israel arguments presented to me over the last year. On balance, I regard them as disingenuous, irrelevant, and designed to pull at my heartstrings in order to obscure the harsh reality of this conflict. We would respond exactly the way that Israel has. The only difference is we would do so with the support of every member of the international community, while Israel has to fight not only the terrorists who want to wipe them off the map, but Western apologists for those terrorists as well. If you enjoy these videos, you should know that they're available on my so I, I think this video, first of all, is is brilliantly done. It's it's particularly compelling given his history, his background. He's not uh, emotionally connected with the Jewish community. He's not emotionally connected with Israel. He was just some guy who didn't know anything about the situation, who let the evidence uh, come in from both sides and speak for itself and make these uh, reasonable uh, conclusions. Uh, I, I thought it was very well done. There's there's certainly stuff, more things that we could we could discuss and pick apart and and, uh, and elaborate upon. But I'd I'd really like to know what you think of it. If you haven't seen, especially if you hadn't seen it yet, uh, what you think about it. You could write down in the comments what your what you think was maybe like the most compelling parts of his argument. And um, I would love to hear and, and and read about what you what your thoughts are on this particular. Um, framing of of everything and if you do enjoy this content overall uh, i'd encourage you to please hit that subscribe button in the, on the lower left and uh, we'd love to uh, continue the conversation further videos take care everybody